So this is a continuation of the video on uh, band theory and metallic bonding and semiconductors from uh, chapter 12 of Chemistry, the Science and Context, third edition. So here we're going to start, we've built up our picture of molecular orbital theory, and we're going to imagine expanding that. So we're going to start with a single copper atom, then we're going to make Cu2 that we've looked at, we're going to keep building that up until we get a full big size chunk of copper solid. So let's imagine what that looks like. So here again is my energy picture, the axis going upwards. Here's our copper atom with the 4s electron, and we've got one of those. Then we take two copper atoms and we bond them together. Remember we get two orbitals now, sigma and sigma star, and both electrons go down here. What if we had four copper atoms bonded together? Well then we would have four molecular orbitals formed from those four atomic orbitals on the four copper atoms. And so they would stack up like this. So these would be bonding orbitals, these would be anti-bonding orbitals, and we would put all four of our valence electrons down here. What if we had eight? Well, the picture just continues, right? So these are bonding orbitals that are occupied, and these are anti-bonding orbitals that are unoccupied, no electrons. Well, if we just keep on doing this until we've got a total of n atoms, where n is a really big number, like Avogadro's number, 6 times 10 to the 23rd. Well, that becomes impossible for me to draw, but you kind of see what's happening. We end up with a whole bunch of levels, and it turns out that these energy levels are very, very closely spaced. And then right here, where the old 4s was in energy, that intersects almost exactly with the top of this level, these blue ones, where I have more and more of these levels really closely spaced. All of these levels are occupied with electrons, so this is filled, and all of these orbitals are empty, unoccupied. We call this the valence band. So notice we've gone from individual levels to these being so close together that they just form what looks like an almost continuous band. I say almost continuous because these gaps are so very tiny in energy. So it would really be easy for an electron anywhere to hop up to the next level because those energy levels are so close. The problem is that electrons can't hop in between these levels that are already occupied. They're full, so you can't do anything. But up here at the very top level, it's fairly easy for this electron to hop up into one of these empty levels. So with just a little bit of energy, you can hop up into this level. Now once the electron is in that level, it is free to move around. So this level allows for electrical conductivity. So you have to promote from filled levels to empty levels, and then you can have movements of the electrons. Because you can't move electrons around when everybody's paired up in the orbitals like that. So that's how we can explain electrical conductivity in copper using this band theory model. So you've got a filled band, and this little structure up here is called a conduction band. It's empty. It's all the valence band. These are all valence atomic orbitals. But because they're empty and they're closely spaced, an electron can gain enough energy just from the heat in the room or perhaps a little bit of voltage placed across um, the wire, the piece of metal, and the electron can be promoted in energy and then move around. So there's electrical conductivity. So let's look at a slightly different case. Let's look in zinc. So zinc has the electron configuration argon 3d10 4s2. And here's a picture of what that might look like in terms of energy. So up here I've drawn in some 4p orbitals. Notice they don't show up in the electron configuration at all. But in theory we could write the functions that are there, they're just unoccupied. So these orbitals that are unoccupied we sometimes call them virtual orbitals. Because they're there, they're just unoccupied and they're not involved in the electron configuration. So if we have zinc 2, we get a sigma bonding and a sigma anti-bonding orbital, now both filled. So this whole band is filled right here. And then these are still some virtual orbitals that come from taking the 4p orbitals on two zinc atoms and uh, making those molecular orbitals out of them, combining them, adding and subtracting them in different ways. And we can keep on doing this. Here's Zn4, might look like this. So here are the uh, sigma bonding and antibonding orbitals, and here are a whole bunch of these p molecular orbitals up here. And if you keep on doing this and make it as large as Avogadro's number, again, we get a whole bunch of these closely spaced levels. So these guys start filling up with levels, and they kind of grow out like this, and I'm not going to draw all the separate ones in there. And same thing down here for this filled valence band. Now it turns out that this band of empty virtual orbitals 
overlaps this band of filled valence orbitals down here a little bit. So we call this upper band of virtual orbitals the conduction band, and this band of filled orbitals the valence band. Notice that it's completely filled. But because we have these empty p orbitals from all these zinc atoms that have overlapped in energy, it's very easy for an electron to actually hop downhill in energy and, and get into one of those conduction band orbitals. Then they're free to move around. So electrons can hop around very easily between the valence band and the conduction band, more or less. So again, some of the pictures I'm drawing are kind of crude to give you an idea of how this works in quantum mechanics. The real details are a little bit more subtle, but this is good enough for our purposes. So electrons can hop in energy when there's a close association between the conduction band and the valence band, and then you get electrical conductivity. So let's think about something that doesn't conduct electricity so well. Semiconductors. So semiconductors are very important materials. They fuel all of the electronics energy uh, industry. So all of your handheld electronics, so all of these little devices, calculators, personal computers, cell phones, the whole works. Semiconductors are integral to those devices. So what are they made of? Well, semiconductors, important component of semiconductors, are metalloids. So you'll remember the metalloids are the elements that are right along this staircase line on the periodic table that separates the metals from the nonmetals. Some examples, boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic. Silicon I've underlined because it's a very important metalloid. It actually accounts for about 27.7% of the elemental mass on Earth's crust. So it's sort of second place, so it gets the second place prize. Woohoo! So oxygen is actually first. So it makes up a whopping amount of Earth's crust, and it's a principal, principal component of rocks. So silicon and oxygen are found in rocks a lot. So silicon is very important, and it is a metalloid. So what are semiconductors? And metalloids make up certain classes of semiconductors. Well, they do conduct electricity, but not well. That's why they're called semiconductors. So let's look a little bit at why it is that some things might conduct electricity well and not so well. So here's the picture that we had just looked at for something like zinc or copper that is a good conductor. So here's the energy. And rather than drawing all those closely spaced levels, I'm just going to represent it as a block. And I shaded it in red to indicate that these are all filled with electrons. So this is the valence band. And right on top of it, or perhaps overlapping it, is the conduction band. So what we say is that there is no band gap. Really easy for an electron to pick up enough energy to be promoted into that conduction band, then you have electrical conductivity. Now in an insulator, we can come up with the same kind of molecular orbital pictures. But in this case, there is a big distance between the last filled level and the first unfilled level. We say that between these two bands, that's why it's called band theory, there's a large band gap. So there's a big band gap. So an electron here would have to acquire a whole lot of energy from some source to get promoted up here where it could move around. So it doesn't. So that's why insulators, electrical insulators, don't conduct electricity because the band gap between their molecular orbitals is too large. So it's too hard to do that without putting in a whopping amount of energy. And then you end up melting the solid or vaporizing things, breaking chemical bonds. Anyway, lots of stuff starts going on then. A semiconductor has properties in between, like metalloids. They have, tend to have physical properties more like metals, but chemical properties more like nonmetals. So a semiconductor is in between. So in this case, we still have a filled valence band, and there's still a conduction band. But what's different in semiconductors is the band gap is, well, relatively small. So with a certain amount of energy, you can cause these electrons to be promoted, and they will start to conduct electricity. So this is useful. One way that you could get that to happen is take your semiconductor material and put it between a voltage. Now if that voltage source isn't very high, you're not going to have enough energy to give to the electrons to cross that gap. But if that voltage turns on higher, the electrons are going to pick up enough energy to jump into that band, and they will conduct electricity. So this acts like a switch that you can turn on or off depending on how you adjust the voltage. And that's why they're so important to the electronics industry, because switches act like ones and zeros that you can store information in, either on or off. And that's the whole basis of binary computing.